Welcome to the Australian War Memorial. Uh, my name is Brendan Nelson. I am the director uh, of the Australian War Memorial and welcome especially here today for the special symposium that we are convening to consider 20 years on the independence of Timor-Leste uh, or East Timor as it's commonly known uh, to Australians. The Australian War Memorial in particular welcomes, and I will officially uh, introduce them as we go through the program, uh, but the Honourable John Howard, uh, OMAC, uh, of course our former uh, Prime Minister, uh, the Honourable General Sir Peter Cosgrove, uh, formerly Governor General uh, of Australia, and many other roles which I'll introduce shortly, Major General Tim McCowan, uh, welcome, uh, Colonel uh, Retired and Colonel Retired uh, James McMahon, uh, Professor Craig Stockings, the official historian for East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, by the way, he has a team of 14 people doing it, it's not just him. Uh, but uh, Samuel Samares, the, Soares, the Charge d'Affaires of Timor-Leste and Corinda Hollis, uh, political uh, and economic advisor for uh, the embassy. Uh, the many distinguished guests that are here, which includes uh, former serving federal police officer, officers, mm -hmm. Uh, Defence Force uh, personnel and members of the broader uh, community of historians and everyday Australians have a particular interest uh, in this significant uh, issue. The vision for the Australian War Memorial was articulated by its founder, Charles Bean, in 1948. Uh, Bean had landed on Gallipoli with the Australians and stayed with them at the front through the entire war, uh, through to Montbarain and the Armistice, he was wounded three times and refused evacuation and conceived the Australian War Memorial at Pozieres in July and August 1916. Witness to 23,000 casualties, Australian casualties in six weeks, 6,800 dead, five Australian Victoria Crosses and a mortally wounded Australian asked him, will, will they remember me in Australia? And from there he conceived and resolved at its end he would build this and he'd write and edit the 12 volumes of the official history over 23 years. The vision that he articulated in 1948 was the year after Australia's first peacekeeping mission in 1947. We live in a world that he could not possibly have imagined, but we remain true to his vision. And one of the many things that I have learned in my seven years here as the director, in fact, I learned it in my first year, is that the paradox is that it is called the Australian War Memorial, but it's not actually about war. In a context of war, these are stories of two million Australian men and women who wear and have worn the uniform of our three services. They are instead stories of love and friendship, love for friends and between friends, love, love of family, love of our country, and honouring a special group of Australians whose lives are devoted not to themselves but to us and their last moments to one another. In a context of war, these are human qualities and in particular characteristics that inform the Australian character. In Granite up there at Isuava are four qualities that were seen in those Australians of the Second World War that had come from those in the first, of sacrifice, endurance, mateship, that spirit that binds us in the face of adversity, and of courage. And this, these events that bring us here today are in many ways the story of courage. That nothing of value in life or in our world is achieved without taking a risk. A spirit that challenges doubt, imposes will, reinforces integrity, advances values, and inspires us to break through fear. It's a story of courage, firstly, on the part of the East Timorese people, who, under immense uh, threat and real violence, as we will hear uh, through the course of this morning, uh, chose their future. The courage of the men and women of the Australian Defence Force, of the SAS, and of their commander, then Major General Peter Cosgrove. The courage of Australian Federal Police, of DFAT officers and civilians, 
the courage of the United Nations that mandated the mission and the 22 countries and men and women of those countries who did what they did in East Timor for the East Timorese. And in a sense, the courage also of the then Indonesian president, B.J. Habibi, in what he chose to do on behalf of Indonesia, which would have immense consequences for the East Timorese people. So I'd firstly like to introduce, uh, ask the charge, uh, Sam Soares, if uh, he would like to speak to us and make some comments on behalf of uh, East Timor. And then I will introduce Mr Howard. Thank you, Sam. The Honourable Prime Minister or former Prime Minister John Howard, General Peter Cosgrave, former Governor General, and the friends of Timor, and also retired generals, um, distinguished guests, colleagues, former police, Australian police, Australian army servers who were there back then. I'm Samuel Soares. I'm a charge A. Something wrong with the mic at the moment. I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, Ambassador Guterres, who is on the way to Germany at the moment. He's supposed to be here if he's here today. But also, I'm here to share, um, as what Dr. Brennan mentioned, the courage for peace. And I think, despite not discounting out the courage of peace around the world, the country that I came from, or the country that I love to be belong to, has got a courage that shows to the world that when you have the power, when you have the will, and when you have a strong hope, there is for you for future that you can reach. 20 years after, that courage is actually inspiring. Not only Australian, but I would say it's growing into the world. That the courage, it should not owned by those who are be able to deliver the security, for those who are be able to deliver the economy, or those who be able to deliver the necessity of the basics that those in need. But the courage should be owned by each one of us, wherever you are in the corner of the world. Because that courage actually gives the truth the sense of humanity. And it doesn't separate where you are, but you are part of the humanity. I'm here just to appreciate that how fundamental that Australian men and women back in 1999 when I was work as interpreter and translator for the UNOMET. And I believe that that is the time for Timor to determine whatever risk we will take, but because we believe that we are not alone. And I watch with my own eyes. I saw former, former Prime Minister when he sort of departure about men and women in somewhere near Australia. He was there. And I was crying somewhere right after when the 4th of September the announcement was made. I couldn't get out from the place where I was because I was surrounded and I have to stay somewhere so that I will be safe and witnessing the history. Of course, all of you are part of it. Interfet will be on the down track of the history of the two country and two people, Australian and Timor-Leste. 
the milestones of these two young two people in two country have shown another time again and again that when the power of courage and loving each other that is we're going to show together to the world and i believe that a young australian you have such this quality of institutions that describe the value you adore the principle you take on and this will become the shining of your country as you started to continue to grow as a middle power and timor leste will come along share what it's got to share not only for his own people in his own country but it is good for the humanity and i'm proud to be in australia the greatest of this institutions in our southern hemisphere to learn how history can tell the power of courage and that's why i'm so honored here to speak on behalf of ambassador and 1.2 million people of timor leste that we together we can journey and make the journey is happen for australian for timor and for the world i believe the historian the witness and the deliver of decision that made in 1999 they are still the witness of this country when it was born and i should stop here because i want to hear from those who made a story and those who were present on the ground and witnessing that this country is unique with its own smile and with its own sharing the story thank you very much Thank you very much Mr Mr Soares uh, not only for what you have said but the tone uh, in which you have said it uh, thank you very very much In terms of the uh, broad brush strokes of this as we know Timor Leste was thrust into crisis on the 27th of January 1999 when then Indonesian president BJ Habibie announced that there would be a referendum held in the then province of East Timor and that the referendum would give the timorese people the choice between greater autonomy or independence and pro indonesian militia pro autonomy militia then conducted a campaign of violence against the east timorese people it didn't meet the threshold uh, for un intervention and the uh, unamet the united nations assistance mission for east timor arrived mid year through 1999 including 50 afp officers and 6 adf personnel to play a role in creating and then oversighting the uh, ballot which would be held on the 30th of August and as we were just uh, so poignantly reminded uh, in on the 4th of September we were informed that almost 80% of the East Timorese people had voted for independence a wave of in fact a storm of violence was then unleashed and then finally on the 14th of September president habibi Uh, announced that the Indonesian government would support a UN mandated mission for East Timor and then just after dawn on the 20th of September HC130 RWF Hercules would land at Kamora airport and uh, filled with uh, members of uh, two battalion uh, RAR under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Mick Slater in terms of courage that was shown that year uh, it also included then Prime Minister John Howard his foreign minister Alexander Downer and his government on the 10th anniversary of John Howard's election to the prime ministership in 2006 10 years after it when asked to nominate his greatest and significant achievements uh, then prime minister Howard said uh, national uniform gun control tax reform and the independence of East Timor and Australia's role in it Uh, John Howard as we know uh, for almost 12 years was our prime minister our second uh, uh, longest serving uh, prime minister and uh, obviously played a critically important role in the events that bring us here uh, so former prime minister Howard welcome to the Australian War Memorial and we look forward to hearing you
Well, thank you very much, uh, Brendan Nelson. Can I say uh, thank you for your very warm welcome and uh, may I express, I'm sure, the views of everybody in this room in paying tribute to the remarkable job you have done over the last seven years uh, as the director of this very special and very important Australian institution. So Peter Cosgrove, former commander of the Interfed Force, former Governor General, uh, the East Timorese Shahzai, Mr Suarez, thank you for your very warm and welcome remarks and others who played a very significant role in those events of some 20 years ago. I'm delighted to share a few reflections with you about those events of more than 20 years ago. Can I start by saying that for many years, East Timor had been on the collective conscience of Australia. There was a remarkable coincidence of groups within the Australian community, not normally in alignment on political and strategic issues, who felt that in some way things had to be put right with East Timor. They were uncomfortable with the way in which Australia, across the political divide, let me say, had acquiesced in the incorporation of East Timor into the Indonesian Republic way back in the mid-1970s. And it is important for me as a, a Liberal, as a former Liberal Prime Minister of Australia, to acknowledge that there was a bipartisan acquiescence in that. It's not a question of necessarily point at the, fing the finger at the other side. I can well remember that when I became Prime Minister, the prevailing view on this issue was that we shouldn't upset Jakarta, that having good relations with Indonesia was the sine qua non of a good foreign policy. And that was a view. But as time went by, and particularly because of that uneasiness across the political divide, attitudes began to change. There had always been on the Labor Party side, particularly amongst its more left-leaning elements, an unhappiness with the way in which the Saharo-led regime in Indonesia had persecuted particularly the Chinese section of the Indonesian population. And they were always immensely unhappy <coughs> with the attitude that their government had taken in the dying months of the Whitlam government and also in opposition to the Fraser government. But I can uh, remember, as a member of that Fraser government, decisions being taken which in effect confirmed the diplomatic acceptance of the incorporation of East Timor into the Indonesian Republic. And I can certainly remember the first time I paid a visit as Prime Minister to Indonesia, having a discussion with the then Indonesian Foreign Minister, Ali Alatas, who incidentally delivered the news to the Security Council in 1999 that Indonesia would accept the Interfet force pursuant to a United Nations resolution. Having a discussion with him at the airport before meeting, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> President Sahara, and talking about the sensitive issues that would come up. And one of them, of course, was East Timor. Now that was the setting, but that began to change international opinion began to shift. But most significantly, in a political sense, the big change occurred when Dr B.J. Habibi became the president of Indonesia. Habibi was different from Saharo. He was about as different as you can imagine in just about every respect. He'd spent a large part of the previous 20 years of his life living and working abroad as a senior executive in the Messerschmitt Corporation. 
Uh, he was a person who shared none of the, what I might loosely call emotional attachment to hanging on to East Timor, uh, which was the approach of so many people in the Indonesian military, particularly its uh, defence minister, I think he was defence minister at that time, uh, was certainly a senior figure, General Waranto. He regarded East Timor as a liability for Indonesia. He didn't think it was worth the trouble, to put it bluntly. He didn't think that uh, having um, to worry about East Timor should rank very highly. And when he, because of the remarkable change in Indonesia, became the president, when Suharto, largely as a consequence of the Asian financial crisis, <coughs> was, was forced to leave, he became the president and he brought a different attitude. And I can recall that late in 1998, not long after the election of that year, we had a meeting of the National Security Council and Alexander Downer, particularly advised by Ashton Calvert, who was then the head of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, sketched to us the changed international attitude. And he, in effect, with, with very great perception, in my view, said that the attitude towards Indonesia was changing, towards Indonesia and East Timor was changing, and that it was important for Australia to consider a change in its policy, lest it be left behind. And arising out of that came uh, the letter that I wrote to Dr Habibi towards the end of 1999, in which I suggested that the Indonesians uh, organise an act of uh, self-expression about the future situation of East Timor by the East Timorese people. That letter did not recommend full independence. It provided the alternatives that fell short of that. And one of those alternatives was for much greater autonomy within the Indonesian Republic. Now, as all of you know, and rather dramatically and, and quite uh, significantly, of course, Dr Habibi decided to go a step further. He gave expression to his own feelings and he decided to offer full independence. Now, of course, the background of all of this was the increasing and reckless and cruel activities of some elements of the Indonesian militia. And that particularly angered many sections of the Australian community who wanted East Timorese independence, including, of course, many of the older sections of the population who remembered with great affection the comfort that the Indonesian people, the East Timorese people, have given to Australian soldiers in their fight against the Japanese in World War II. They thought that Australia was not expressing enough gratitude for that wartime support and loyalty. So against the background of this, the United Nations sanctioned ballot takes place in extraordinarily difficult circumstances. But meanwhile, preparations were underway against the possibility that Australia might be invited to <coughs> participate in an intervention force. And a brigade was put on alert in the early part uh, of 1999, so that if, as finally eventuated, we were invited to contribute, and indeed, uh, through the agency of General Peter Cosgrove, lead the intervention force we were in a position to do so. <coughs> Excuse me a moment. And as has been mentioned, the ballot did take place. But prior to that ballot taking place, I had a meeting with Dr Habibi after a particularly violent incident involving... Um, the activities of some of the rogue militia, which had caused the deaths of many East Timorese people, 
And at that particular meeting, which largely consisted on a one-on-one -on -one dialogue between the President and me, I could neither speak German nor Indonesian. So uh, it was uh, my, I hope, uh, adequate English against his less than perfect, but nonetheless very effective English, which caused a lot of discomfort to many of his advisers. But I can say that he didn't let his side down and he stuck very strongly to the Indonesian position that they would not allow any peacekeepers to go into East Timor before the ballot actually took place. And what was amazing to me and still remains amazing 20 years later was that there were people in Australia actually demanding that I send Australian forces immediately to East Timor. And when I confronted them with the reality that that would be equivalent, wouldn't be equivalent, would actually be invading the Republic of Indonesia, that did not seem to trouble them one bit. Such was the emotional feeling <coughs> in the Australian community about what was happening to the East Timorese people. Now, in the final analysis, of course, we were invited by the United Nations uh, to lead an intervention force. It would become the largest overseas deployment of Australian forces since Vietnam. And in the psyche of our country, it was a very significant event. Vietnam, of course, had been a divisive military involvement by Australia. And whilst I've put on record my own view that I felt in the circumstances of the time that the Menzies government had taken the right decision to involve Australia in Vietnam, I nonetheless acknowledged that it was something that was divisive within the Australian community. And I think the community was aware that this very big involvement, as it became, uh, would put Australia in the world spotlight. And uh, depending on the success or failure of the mission, there would be judgments made about our nation uh, and its capacity in such events. But in the final analysis, we were invited to lead the force, and it was so capably and brilliantly and effectively led by Major General, as I think he then was, uh, Peter Cosgrove, uh, whose skill in leading the mission and his projection of the aims and the values of the mission, both military and otherwise, won the affection and regard of the Australian community uh, at that time, and that has remained the case over the 20 years that have gone by. It represented a quite remarkable diplomatic effort by Australia to assemble the contributors that we did. We were immediately supported by our New Zealand neighbours. The then Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jenny Shipley, said that New Zealand would contribute a battalion. And I'm very happy to say that when she, as a centre-right Prime Minister, was replaced by Helen Clark as a centre-left Prime Minister not long afterwards. One of the first things Helen Clark did to her great credit was to say that the New Zealand commitment would remain. I was determined that we would have contributions from countries in the region. I did not want it to be a white Anglo-Celtic operation in the Asian region, and therefore I was delighted that we had contributions from Thailand and from other countries in the region. So it was very much an international force. It won the respect of the United Nations. We secured a very ample mandate from the Security Council and having in mind the terrible events of Srebrenica during the dissolution, the tragic dissolution of the old Yugoslavia, um, the the then Australian um, am Ambassador, Andrew Peacock, passed on to me the strong, uh, involved, the strong views of Americans who had been involved in the United Nations, particularly Richard Holbrook, who negotiated the Dayton Accords that brought an end uh, to the uh, tragic events in that part of the world 
that it was important that the intervention force had an ample mandate so that the terrible fate that befell the, the Dutch peacekeepers in Srebrenica did not befall Australian peacekeepers. History, of course, records that the operation was highly successful and a great deal is owed again to General Cosgrove and others in his leadership group for negotiating a very peaceful, relatively speaking, and harmonious entry into East Timor when the time finally arrived. We look back now and think, well, of course, it was all ordained to be like that, but it wasn't. And I can, I know from my own experience and those on the ground would know even more sharply than I did just how apprehensive we were. And I can recall when my wife and I went to Townsville on the eve of the departure of the first elements and spoke to many of the troops that were going to go into East Timor the following day, how apprehensive we were about what might lie in front of them. But fortunately, they were unimpeded when the intervention occurred. And one of the things that was of enormous help to them was that they did have the support of the entire nation. I can certainly recall that about the time the intervention took place was also the time of the NRL Grand Final <coughs> of 1999. I remember that particularly well because I'm a follower of the St George Club and St George led 14-0 at half time <laughs> but ended up losing. And as Prime Minister, I had the job of handing the trophy to the victorious captain, Glenn Lazarus, <laughs> the brick with eyes, they called him, uh, who went on to become a senator. And to his enormous credit, after I'd given him the trophy, the first thing he did was to wish the men who'd gone into East Timor only a few days earlier the best of good fortune and express the gratitude of the country. I think it's also fair to recall that initially, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we had some difficult moments with our American friends. I had thought uh, that the Americans would provide some ground forces, but in a long uh, telephone conversation I had with President Clinton, uh, he indicated that that was not possible. And I learned something during that telephone conversation that I'd never fully appreciated before. And that was what an enormous uh, peace dividend, so to speak, the Americans had taken out of the end of the Cold War. And that they had run down quite a bit of their expenditure on defence. And he said to me very plainly, he said, uh, the American military, believe it or not, is too stretched to provide the sort of assistance you want. But sensing, uh, as he undoubtedly would have from the tone of our conversation, that we were a tad disappointed that that was the attitude. Uh, from then on, he worked overtime to make sure that even though there were no American ground troops, a lot of American assistance in logistics and diplomatically and otherwise and in the diplomatic area, a visit that was paid to Jakarta by uh, William Cohen, who was then the American Defence Secretary, making it very plain that the Americans would be uh, mightily unhappy uh, if any grief were to come to the intervention force. So, to put it bluntly, uh, they made up for lost ground and I was very grateful for the assistance that the Americans did provide. And there was fortuitously an APEC meeting in New Zealand at the time and as it all came together, I was able to have some further discussions with President Clinton and the senior minister from Indonesia who was representing his country at that gathering. So as they say, in a way, the, the rest is history. But it's a very important piece of Australian post-Cold War history. For the very first time, Australia was seen as leading in its own right a major overseas deployment. Now, other deployments in the past 
<clears throat> had always been part of a broader force, meritorious though all of them clearly were. And as a result, uh, the eyes of the world were very much on Australia. And Australia was seen to have done incredibly well. First and foremost, the courage and skill displayed by the men and women of the ADF, the diplomatic skill, the work of the police who operated under incredibly dangerous circumstances, particularly in the lead up and the immediate aftermath uh, of the United Nations super supervised ballot. Because the unwillingness of the rogue elements of the Indonesian militia um, to accept the outcome of the ballot should not be in any way underestimated. But it was a very successful, indeed very proud moment for Australia on the world scene. But importantly, it was an emotional moment of liberation and freedom for the people of East Timor. We may have had the odd disagreement about resource sharing and so forth since, and that is in the want of two independent nations uh, operating in the same region. But we have never forgotten the extraordinary contribution of the people of East Timor to the Australian military during World War II. I think the extent to which East Timor had been on our collective conscience for almost a generation, there was an enormous sense of relief in the Australian community that we could finally feel comfortable with the position that we had uh, found ourselves in. And importantly, we had been able, at a political, geostrategic level, to organise and lead an intervention force with the sanction and support of the United Nations, drawing on the disparate elements amongst the nations in the region in which we live. As many of you might suspect, I have not always and certainly wasn't always when I was Prime Minister, an uncritical admirer of everything that the United Nations did. But my philosophy that the United Nations is at its best when it's serving a cause that has broad international support and combines elements of humanity and peacekeeping in the best sense of that expression, that in those circumstances, the United Nations is an organisation that one can enthusiastically support. And on this occasion, we were able to work harmoniously with the United Nations, and I was very grateful for that. So this is, most importantly of all, a moment to remember what was delivered to the people of East Timor, the freedom and the capacity to live their own lives according to their own wishes. And from we in Australia, it was a proud moment because all the elements of the Australian character came together. The courage and the capacity and the bravery of our military, the ability of our non-military assets, our diplomatic service, our police and the like, uh, to work for a common purpose and the ordinary a humanity and decency of the men and women of the Australian Defence Force. So it is something of which I believe the Australian community can be very proud indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I feel as if I should be reaching for a stethoscope, but uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'll go back to the medical profession. Uh, well, thank you very, very much. We're privileged to have had that uh, insight uh, from our former Prime Minister, John Howard. And uh, I should also say to you, as the then backbench member for Bradfield in the prime, former Prime Minister's first budget in 1996, consolidating the nation's finances, the only area that was not cut was defence. And it was entirely because uh, then Prime Minister Howard had said to his Cabinet colleagues, I've spent 23 years uh, 
getting into this position, humour me, let's not cut defence. And uh, three years later, uh, the same people who had complained that defence had not been cut were the first ones writing in and phoning to demand that we, to use your expression, invade Indonesia. So, uh, interesting world. Uh, if you made a list of the, if I did certainly, the top 25 most significant Australians of my generation, uh, we've just heard from one, and now I will introduce uh, another. Uh, General Sir Peter Cosgrove, as we know, is an RMC Duntroon graduate, a military cross recipient uh, from Vietnam, rose to the ranks of uh, Chief of the Australian Army, Chief of the Australian Defence Force, a former Australian of the Year, our 26th Governor General, and of course came to national prominence uh, in the events that bring us here as Major General Peter Cosgrove leading Interfet uh, into uh, East Timor. And, uh, and formerly also, of course, a chairman of the Council of the Australian War Memorial. Uh, Sir Peter, uh, welcome back. Oh, well, good morning, and uh, I've been delighted to, to have been invited to give these remarks, and I'm looking forward to not only setting out my stall in relation to some personal reflections on the Interfed operation, uh, but uh, perhaps in the margins, if uh, I haven't satisfied your questions, uh, you can attack me in a break and, and uh, pose those questions. Uh, on another recent and related symposium encompassing that period and those events, I mentioned there that in retrospect, the operation which we codenamed Operation Stabilise, was not only in the, in the broad, a watershed moment for Australia's international and security activities, and our former Prime Minister has uh, very eloquently canvassed that, but it became a renaissance for the orientation and uh, the public regard and indeed some of the organising principles of the Australian Defence Force and its component services. So to me, that's an important conclusion in which we should frame any of my further remarks. Uh, put another way, in 1999, East Timor just happened. It was not something that the government had anticipated before the interchange of letters between our Prime Minister and Dr Habibi. There was no premeditation, but we were in a much different place within the ADF as a result of the challenges, very largely overcome, of East Timor in 1999 and several years thereafter. So it is a watershed moment. Uh, it's appropriate to call it a renaissance. I've been asked today to canvas some of the decisions that I made. Now, of course, we flatter ourselves sometimes that it was my decision. It may have been my strong preference which was allowed. But I'll call them decisions because <laughs> I'm that sort of fella. Um, um, there'll only be a few of them able to be canvassed in the time we've got. So uh, it's, a, it's a selection of decisions. Uh, in May and June 99, we at the headquarters of the First Division, which was also Deployable Joint Force Headquarters, uh, were busily engaged in contingency planning around the UN uh, lodgement of officials and police um, and other associated workers uh, for the election process. We were looking at the thought of, if needed, how would we go to their rescue if uh, there was a need to bring them out? There'd been leaks all over the place in Canberra about all kinds of things, but leaks of classified information. So the word came to my headquarters to, that we, amongst others, should cease and desist on contingency planning. Now, uh, I didn't turn an absolute blind eye to this. I understood that in comprehensive planning, you deal between agencies, military agencies and often... Uh, agencies outside the military. And that was in this huge web of interaction where the vulnerability to further leaks lay. So we obeyed the order in the sense that we closed our loop. 
our planning continued. It continued on the basis that if we did have to go or command an operation that went into East Timor to help the UN to evacuate, uh, that we couldn't just sort of drop the guillotine on planning around May, June. We had to actually continue to flesh out that planning. So this decision to interpret that order uh, was a decision I took and I was very grateful later. What appeared to be an absolute uh, sort of uh, spring into action uh, in early September actually had months of planning behind it. Uh, this was, of course, a, a risky thing. I could have been given a difficult phone call to pack my bags if it had transpired that notwithstanding the concerns, proper concerns in Canberra about leaking that had occurred, um, and that obviously, that sort of thing is very damaging to government's opportunities for flexibility. So uh, we had to be very careful. We were careful, we continued our planning, and we were much better off uh, for having had that uh, sort of more solid planning. So that was one which uh, has not come to, uh, to light before, but I thought it would be a useful thing to contribute now. Uh, the next one was, uh, and this is pretty much on a time basis, uh, people will recall that in September, early September, there was an evacuation operation, Operation Spitfire. This was conducted by the Royal Australian Air Force, some uh, army administrative types, but also uh, protected uh, the aircraft uh, and, and the actions right around the aeroplane were uh, protected by special forces under Tim's command. The, um, the notion of that ordinarily, with all kinds of SAS uh, interventions and operations, is at that stage there was a somewhat uh, bespoke chain of command that Tim would talk to the command of special forces, who would talk to the chief of the defence force, and through the de chief of the defence force government would monitor and, um, and adjust operations. Now, I wanted to have that group for that operation under my command. Why? Because I knew that if there was to be a subsequent intervention of a peacemaking force, uh, it would be a large force, the special forces would be a pivotal component. I wanted those, uh, I'll say men, but probably men and women would be more appropriate these days. I wanted those people under me so we could get to know each other before uh, we met up on, if you call it D-Day, into East Timor several weeks later. So I lobbied for that to occur, and that, the logic of that was agreed, and instead of them being under this bespoke uh, and possibly uh, practised uh, chain of command through their Special Forces Commander through to the CDF, it was placed under me. Um, and that proved to be very useful because I think we were able to hit the ground rather ru running rather more uh, faster and more accurately than what would have been the case otherwise. The next decision, which I think is very interesting, and this is beloved of the non-government organisations, the, the, the furphy that uh, so everybody was starving in East Timor, so when we arrived, we should have shotgunned out all over the island uh, to provide little pockets of uh, reassurance so that... Uh, urgent life-saving food could be delivered to uh, people who actually grow their own. So um, we didn't do that. We went to Dili. Dili was the vital ground. Uh, that drove the initial uh, deployments and it drove our manoeuvre, that is our uh, actions on the ground, for the first couple of weeks. There were exceptions. The Special Forces uh, were available and did move outside Dili uh, for particular missions from time to time. But the vast bulk of the troops were pacifying and consolidating in Dili before we started to push out to the countryside. Uh, Dili, because it was the natural and best point of entry, uh, was the obvious area of violent activity. So much of those uh, horrible scenes of violence and murder and mayhem and burning were out of Dili. Uh, it was the most dense population and it had largely fled up into the hills and it was the political centre of gravity. Even though the political class were not operating there at risk of their lives, um, it was going to be, of course, immediately the focal point for returning political activity. Uh, this stood behind the concept of lodgement and build-up. Uh, I insisted that if we were going to go into uh, Dili, where there was a, 
obviously a grouping of militia. T and I were passing through Dili, uh, fundamentally either to go out by sea, by air, or by truck down to West Timor, that always coming through Dili, uh, and uh, I needed enough forces there to show that we were a powerful force uh, with a clear mission and that we were not to be uh, taken lightly. So we needed two infantry battalions and su appropriate supporting arms and legs, armour and, uh, and aviation and that sort of thing, and we needed a lot of first line logistics, and we needed all that on the ground in the first 24 hours. Now, the outcome was great stress on the movement and logistics system, uh, and of course that's been sort of turned over in time. It worked, uh, and we got ourselves on the ground. Uh, it was the right call. Anything less than that would have uh, perhaps opened us up to more opportunistic violence than was actually the case. The next one I want to refer to you is uh, the fact that there were 22 nations. This has been reflected upon uh, in many places in the past that we had all these contributing nations. Some of them took many months to arrive, not many months, we're, we're only there just a bit short of six months, but some of them were coming in the last several weeks. But overall, 22 nations in Interfed. And I suppose in the first uh, six to eight weeks, we got the majority of those nations got feet on the ground. I created command areas, or they're basically areas of operations which were the responsibility of major international contingents. Um, so this was to match the subtleties of those international interests. Each nation came with their own agenda. There were probably many uh, corporate shared goals within those national interests, national agenda, but there would also be subtleties. So to match the international contingents to an area, to a task, a set of tasks that suited them best was an important component of satisfying the fact that they'd committed. Um, this was part of the broader pattern of coalition management. So it struck me first and foremost that you, you, you might direct coalitions, but you have to manage them as well. And in that management, it's not just a, uh, yeah, here, here's, here's some nice words spoken when you arrive, and I'll see you in a few months. It's day by day management. We started to set up, we did set up, a large coalition management uh, task, which came into my headquarters and involved liaison officers and frequent consultation and visitation. Um, it was still working well towards the end when I negotiated that the Jordanian battalion last to arrive into Interfet, uh, and they stayed on, of course, for uh, Untayet later, I got them to take over down in the Enclave. Now, the Enclave was an unpopular place in the sense that it was remote, and it was uh, uh, therefore supportable at arm's reach. And it was my great glee when I was speaking with the Jordanian lead uh, senior officer and I said, uh, where would you wish the Jordanian battalion to go? He said, anywhere you like. I said, have I got a place for you? <laughs> and they did well. And they did well. Now, the next one. The relationship with TNI. Now, uh, ex-Prime Minister Howard uh, is absolutely correct that the mood within Australia was uh, evolved from a, perhaps a, a sense of um, default, respect of whatever Indonesia wished to do. It, we're in a new place. But equally, we had a future place with Indonesia. So I put this remark under the title of decisions, but it's probably more an outcome than something I could mandate. So this is on the ground. I will say though that I quickly came to the view that we should exploit every ounce of influence, leverage, goodwill and collaboration available while they are in that phase of urgent repatriation. There was some number just south of 20,000 people uh, in TNI uniforms moving out of East Timor. And they're all funneling through, guess where, Dilly, and the opportunities there for friction, misunderstanding, mischance, misadventure, conflict, they were pretty high. So 
this collaboration would take place at very many levels. Of course, I consulted daily with the, whoever the senior Indonesians were at the time, um, and I uh, encouraged subordinates to always have the same process with their counterparts in TNI. Um, I kept in, uh, clearly in mind that the priorities for us all were the Interfet mission given by the United Nations in Security Council Resolution 1264. Um, and beyond that, though, uh, I had some other priorities which are assumed from whatever is written in the uh, Security Council Resolution. Uh, we obviously had to take care of the East Timorese, and that was part of uh, 1264. But then there was force protection for our people. And next, the long-term nature of Australia's relationship with the Republic of Indonesia. One leg of the operational mission set, which Australia and the other constituent forces were issued by me, was the mantra to maintain or improve relationships with Indonesia. And this was understood to be essentially through the day-to-day -day relationship with TNI. So we reached this point which was almost inevitable. It was almost ordained after the Habibi letter, the election process, and then the, um, the subsequent violence, that there, there had been enormous friction. I think I was burned in effigy twice in Jakarta. Um, uh, so in all of that, uh, we needed to say, OK, now what we produce every day is a healing process. Last of my abbreviated list of decisions was the policy towards UNTAYET, the follow-on Blue Beret force. This was to get that force on the ground as soon as possible. There are all sorts of reasons for my sense of urgency. One of them might be said was to counteract a certain sense of inertia that is inherent in the traditional UN approach to force projection. The UN likes to organise itself and good luck to them, and why not? I mean, there's a lot of money involved, and the contributor nations ought to be very aware that let the UN do this properly and effectively and efficiently. But that is the, the enemy of time, and, of course, the uh, projection of the UN force was also further perhaps handicapped by the thought, well, we've got a security force there. We don't need to hurry. My thought was, yes, you do need to hurry because the force that I was leading was ad hoc. And ad hoc forces do a wonderful job because they get there fast, but they are very, very expensive to maintain. So we had a, a change in the whole of community ground rules quite quickly. Uh, and we could therefore say to the UN, look, this place is actually quite secure. And if you just hurry up and get here, you can go straight into more traditional UN work of uh, peace reinforcement, peacekeeping, not peacemaking. Um, it was costing Australia an arm and a leg to support the Australian forces. Plus, remember, of course, that we were supporting uh, a lot of the other contingents. Uh, some of them, of course, had their own national lines of communication. The Kiwis were pretty good. Uh, but there was no contingent there that wasn't uh, a dollar impost on the Australian taxpayer. So it was best to get the UN in. The other thing is the UN uh, is quite used to having that uh, evolution of internal domestic uh, political development, and that was returning to uh, East Timor uh, lickety split. I can remember I knew that it was time for us to move on when I had a delegation of uh, notable politicians in Dili came to see me complaining bitterly about the noise and dust being thrown up by Interfet's armoured personnel carriers as they roared around the Dili streets. And uh, some staff officer, possibly Mark Kelly, complained bitterly that, you know, ingrates. And I said, no, this is a sign of success. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, look, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to echo something that uh, our revered former Prime Minister has said, uh, and that is that uh, it was an absolute privilege for the Australians who were there. It was an absolute privilege, I, I assess, 
for the 21 other nations who had people there, all of those military people. And I, I, I think I can uh, say for the police and the Electoral Commission staff and all those Australians who were there for, in various capacities to be there at the birth of this new nation. And it is in the hugely busy time that the Australian Defence Force uh, continues to have for those who were fortunate enough to spend that sort of six months, a little less than six months, uh, in East Timor as part of the Interfet Force, uh, a life-changing uh, experience, an unforgettable experience, and uh, I represent them all very proudly amongst you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Peter, and uh, it's certainly the case that you and those men and women whom you commanded made us proud to be Australians, very proud. Uh, I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, two, two of our heroes, really, uh, not necessarily household names, uh, with possible exception of James McMahon, who's currently Western Australian of the Year. But uh, I don't know how we're going to run this, but you, you're both supposed to be sharing this session, but though there's only one lectern, so we haven't put the chairs out. And could I also say to Anne Benny, uh, perhaps we could have the image of the entire mission on the screen, as much as I love our partners, BAE Systems. Uh, so perhaps our, our people, uh, as Sir Peter uh, coined uh, the image this morning uh, in our Courage for Peace exhibition, uh, the image that uh, reflects the mission in East Timor. We might pop that up as a backdrop. Uh, Major General Tim McCowan uh, was uh, basically ex-Regular uh, Army, ex-SAS, uh, Special Operations Commander from 2008 to 2011, uh, finished his military career as the Defence Attaché in the United States. But uh, Tim co assumed command of the Special Air Services Regiment in 1999 until 2001. And he commanded, as you probably gather from Sir Peter's comments, the special operations component of Interfet. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross uh, and uh, also with three squadron SASR, the Meritorious Unit Citation. Uh, as Chief uh, Staff Officer of the Joint Operation Command during 2001, he also was responsible for the operational planning for Australia uh, for uh, Afghanistan's Operation Slipper and Operation Falconer in Iraq. Uh, an immense contribution to this country and its security. Uh, similarly, James McMahon, uh, DSC, DSM, uh, 22 years of service to this country in the uniform of the Australian Army, currently the Chief Operating Officer for Australian Capital Equities and also a member of the Council of the Australian War Memorial, so he's my boss. Uh, I'll be very nice to him. Um, plus, he's not the sort of guy you want to get offside with, obviously. Uh, James also was the commander of the Special Air Services Regiment in 2005 and 2006. Uh, he was the SAS squadron commander in East Timor and uh, his unit, as I just mentioned, was ordered the, uh, awarded the Meritorious Unit Citation. Uh, he has a DSC and a DSM for his leadership and command in East Timor and also Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, we welcome both of you uh, to this important symposium. Thank you. I don't know if we're heroes, and uh, and I don't know if I'm your boss, Brendan. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, what we're going to do this morning is uh, really talk about things on the ground. Uh, I've got my my former boss here, Tim, and I'll just do some opening remarks, and then uh, we'll go through some things on Operation uh, uh, Spitfire, then Operation Stabilize, and then I'll just finish with some some closing remarks. So uh, just a, a brief intro. So, so thanks very much, Brendan. And uh, could I echo uh, that's what's come out before from the council. Thanks for, for everything you've done here for the last seven years. So we really, really appreciate it coming from veterans. So thanks very much, Brendan. Uh, distinguished guests from Australia, Timor, internationally, that have already been introduced by Brendan. Uh, those that have served are currently serving their families Interfet veterans and our friends from Timor-Leste. Before I begin, let me acknowledge the traditional owners, past, present and emerging. For Tim and I, uh, it's an honour and a privilege for us to be asked 
to speak to you here today, to reflect on our personal experiences, contribution to, and significance of Interfet. Many could have, have been chosen to speak here today about our reflections on the ground, as so many in this room as well contributed to the peace and security that Interfet achieved. Our reflections will not do justice to the contribution of so many on the ground. However, Interfet provided a peace and security for, in my view, transition, democracy, prosperity and hope that all who contributed can be proud of from the highest levels of international governments to those that served on the ground from around the globe. It was motivating and inspiring to have witnessed the Timorese leaders and people, international community, the Australian Defence Force and other Australian and international organisations, including police, come together at all levels for a common cause. And this has been mentioned this morning, a testimony to the best in humanity. Having been to Timor-Leste recently as part of an Australian non-profit that has been supporting the Delhi Hospital for the last 13 years, that peace, security and hope continues because of the spirit and pride of the Timorese people. The same spirit and pride I observed during Interfet and the same, same spirit and pride shown to Australian soldiers during World War II. In fact, this year marks the 77 years since the fighting between the 2-2 Commando uh, Squadron and Japanese forces in East Timor in 42. Many East Timorese were killed because they helped Australian soldiers. That spirit and pride has been created not by words, but by actions. Actions of courage, compassion, and commitment to hope, family, friendship, and each other. Recently, uh, when I was in Timor, Timor Leste, at the end of the day, in Dili, I've got to say, over a beer at a rooftop bar in my hotel, I reflected on the beautiful lights of the hills around Dili and clearly remember my first night at the heliport on the 20th September 99. Those lights were all fires and the smell of burning and excrement was everywhere. Those, light, those fires are now lights and that is the spirit and pride of Timorese people. So what we're going to do now with, uh, with my former boss, I was the OC uh, commanding officer, we're just going to go through, first of all, Tim will set the context for both those operations, and then we'll pick up some points along the way, some that have been discussed and things that, uh, that happen on the ground. Some will have a little bit of humour, some will be quite serious. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, what I really wanted to do is to give you a, a bit of a, an inkling of an understanding as to why uh, the SAS was chosen initially to go in and do the services assisted evacuation of the uh, uh, UNIMET force uh, under Operation Spitfire. And the simple reason for that was that we were, we had uh, pre-positioned ourselves in many, many senses. We had prepared the, the SAS regiment in anticipation of uh, such an eventuality. And I'm not saying that the SAS regiment was different in many other ways, except that we were on a very short notice to move at all times. And so it behoved us, it was part of the culture of the SAS regiment, uh, to prepare for likely contingencies. And so I had uh, deliberately developed within James's uh, squadron uh, a linguistic capability. We had sent soldiers on colloquial TETUM courses. We had about 13 soldiers qualified as uh, TETUM linguists and about 15 uh, Bahasa or Indonesian speaking soldiers within the same force element. And that was a deliberate strategy. We had followed the intelligence very, very closely. We had uh, gathered human and signals intelligence and whatever information we could gather through open source in order to best inform ourselves about the possibility of a contingency. Uh, we had no privileged knowledge as to whether that was going to eventuate, but it looked as though the storm clouds, figuratively speaking, were gathering. And so uh, we prepared, as any professional soldier would, for the likelihood. Um, I was also, at the time, preparing 
of the SAS Regiment for the 2000 Olympics contingency, a counter-terrorist responsibility. And so I had uh, a preparation for a counter-terrorist responsibility, preparation for a likely contingency or a contingency that looked as though it was emerging. And I also had uh, a planning responsibility to set aside another force element for any other contingencies that might arise. Uh, that led to me uh, doing a very, very expedient, uh, very brief regimental deployment size exercise which tested our capacity to be able to deploy three force elements, three SAS squadrons concurrently. And, and we very shortly discovered in doing that, they didn't deploy very far, I think to HMAS Lewin, to Garden Island and to uh, RAF Base Pierce in the vicinity of, of Swanbourne. But that le that le we learned from that very, very quickly that we had limited logistics capacity and importantly our vulnerability, our major vulnerability, was our capacity to be able to sustain communications for those three force elements. So uh, we remedied those, those shortcomings in a very short, um, a very short period, uh, which then coincided uh, happily with us being called to deploy to RAF Base Tyndall in order uh, to deploy into Dili, if required, for a special recovery exercise, a, a special recovery operation. It wasn't initially a services assisted evacuation. It was initially we were deployed in order to recover uh, UNIMET personnel, if required, in an extremist situation from the compound within Dili. Thankfully, uh, I'm very pleased to say that whilst we were brought to a 20 minute notice to move at one point, uh, we never had to deploy under those conditions to do that because I fear we would have almost certainly lost lives. But we then, because we were positioned, we were ready, we were prepared in a, in a, um, a military sense for the operation, uh, General Cosgrove uh, and others at the strategic level decided that it would probably be appropriate to use this force element ready and willing to be able to go in and conduct the services assisted evacuation. And under my command I had, uh, uh, rather unusually for a young Lieutenant Colonel, I had about 1800 men and women. I had 13 Black Hawk under command, 13 or 18 Black Hawk under command, 13 C-130s, two P-3 Orions, a B-350, two Caribou aircraft, one rifle company, uh, B Company 3RAR, one SAS squadron, three SAS squadron, a Kiwi SAS troop, and a number of other uh, minor force elements, but a substantial force element uh, under command of one lowly Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and so that, that was the context in which uh, we then set about uh, the recovery, the services assisted evacuation of uh, the UN personnel in, uh, from Dili. And we did that over a period of about seven days, during which time uh, the RAF, our RAF brethren flew 39 sorties and we extracted from Dili about uh, two and a half thousand individuals. Uh, and I must say, my hat, I, I take my hat off to the uh, UNIMET personnel who were in there, many of whom were extraordinarily traumatised by the experiences they'd had up to date, up until that point. Uh, I have great, the greatest admiration for the circumstances in which they found themselves. James. Yeah, during that time, uh, there's only one really, uh, th there was a number of uh, operations going on, but the one that I recall uh, the most was uh, when I first got to see what was happening on the ground. I think it was on the, uh, the 7th of September, 99, at, uh, at Bacow. And uh, we flew out there, got there, landed that day, but uh, it was the first time in my life, actually, I'd seen uh, women and men cowering and cowering in a sense of the militia were there and they were coming to the airfield because we landed um, to get people on board. And that particular operation is where we got some high profile uh, East Timorese leaders and religious leaders out that day. 
Uh, but to do that, uh, and I'll never forget this, uh, we had to put 160 people or so on the C-130. And the humorous thing about that for me is when we were coming into Darwin to land, <laughs> the, uh, the air traffic controller as we were coming in, uh, he said, can you confirm 160 on that aircraft, which is, you know, built for far less than that. But uh, taking, uh, as was said before by the esteemed speakers, uh, a little bit of risk and you get there. But I feel if some of those people hadn't have got out, there, out of there today, at, at that time, uh, they wouldn't have got out. Um, so it was serious and uh, I've got goosebumps now here talking to you about it because I'm visualising it. But uh, I was very proud of the fact that, again, the Air Force and Australians and other people on the ground um, actually got that 160 people out because that was the last flight we got out of that airfield. We'll now move on to uh, Op Stabilise and we'll uh, uh, move into there and, um, and I'll just get Tim to set again the context as we transition to Op Stabilise. I had, uh, in anticipation of, remember, we're a force already positioned in Tyndall. Uh, we had deliberately circulated through the three SAS group as many individuals as we could and given them exposure of what it was like in Dili. So we had, to a degree, a limited uh, understanding of what was going on on the ground. Um, and we were positioned there in order to sustain a special recovery uh, operation. So it made a lot of sense that General Cosgrove would see uh, utility and us going in as an advanced element of uh, Operation Stabilise. Um, I had a very, very artful uh, strategy which I thought I would employ uh, in this operation in support of uh, General Cosgrove, which lasted about a week before I realised that uh, uh, clearly uh, I had not a great deal to, uh, of input to what was going to occur strategically. and. Uh, all the training that I had done over the years in guerrilla warfare, I thought, I, you know, I will remove from the militia elements their command and control and separate from them, thereby emasculating them to a degree and giving General Cosgrove great freedom of manoeuvre. Well, uh, my first initiatives with, uh, through Tao Matan Ruak in order to make contact with the militia put paid to that ideal very, very quickly. And uh, I realised that there were very different strategic circumstances and, in fact, the very tactical or operational view that I had needed to be elevated. And um, I was very careful to imbue that within the forces that were under my command. And as General Cosgrove's already uh, suggested, the foremost, foremost in my thinking was the fact that we needed to sustain a lasting relationship with our near neighbour, Indonesia, and with the aspirations of the fledgling nation of East Timor, um, Timor-Leste. And so everything that we did was predicated by ensuring that that relationship was sustained. Uh, the worst thing that we could do was to create an environment where we were at loggerheads with or opposed to TNI, as they would as they were deftly trying to move out of uh, Dili. Um, we, of course, were focused on and needed to focus on the security of the East Timorese people themselves. And we needed to sustain their confidence and build their confidence in the fact that uh, the Interfet force was there to assist them. And it was very confusing for them. As General Cosgrove's already suggested, Interfet was there, um, secure, in Dili, preparing for subsequent operations. But at the same time, the TNI were flowing through Dili. And it appeared to many of the East Timorese people that there was a degree of complicity or even uh, some form of um, uh, close cooperation between TNI, uh, under whose hand they had suffered over many, many years. And so we were careful to make sure that we reinforced the, the security of the people of East Timor. I was also mindful that because of the agility of and the forward preparation of uh, my force elements, that we were able to provide to General Cosgrove a great deal of intelligence and forewarning. 
And so that was primarily our focus, to provide the eyes and ears to the Interfet force and to permit very detailed, very careful planning within headquarters Interfet for subsequent operations. Um, and lastly, of course, was a capacity to be able to react in an agile sense to those things that required uh, a very quick uh, security response, a very timely security response, uh, which James can speak about now. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so really, uh, as has been previously mentioned by uh, Sir Peter, uh, at that time there was Response Force, which was helping with quick reaction in Dili and, uh, and around the country, and, and there was uh, Three Brigade, etc., and the international forces in Dili. And I suppose our job was an element of responsiveness, uh, intelligence gathering, and also messaging, which uh, Tim has just covered. But I'll quickly talk about one particular event that happened on the 26th of September, which was uh, a place called Com, which is at the far eastern end of uh, Timor-Leste. Uh, there's a little, a little um, uh, port area or wharf area there. And effectively, uh, going on to last light on the afternoon, there was uh, up to 2,000 people that were displaced. There was militia there. The town was burning. Uh, and through the general's headquarters, uh, through Tim, I got the uh, the order that be prepared to move. I think it was in 30 minutes' notice to move, effectively as quickly as possible, to show that we could react and 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 show Philantel, Quite frankly, we could react and get down and support East Timor East Timorese people. Uh, so, you know, I suppose after 12 years of training. Uh, this was it, and uh, away we went with a New Zealand troop as well as Australian troops, Blackhawks, uh, HMAS Adelaide was coordinated on the corner, on the, on the way. Uh, effectively, the Blackhawks had to refuel as they got there, um, which, was, uh, which is a great uh, measure of our force projection capabilities. Uh, we got on the ground, and uh, I could see the burning in the distance. I could see a lot of... Uh, a lot of activity in COM itself. And this is last light with no preparation. And I remember, uh, and that's why it was important to have uh, Tim here today, but uh, I learned a lot about command that day and the importance of all the training. Uh, and I phoned back into to Tim, not phoned over the radio. <laughs> uh, and, and I said, uh, this is what's happening on the ground. And it was wonderful to have that reassurance right through to the top through the chain of command about the ability. James, you make your decision, understand what you're doing. And, and that gave me great confidence, actually. Uh, and at times in, on operations, you need that little bit of confidence. And uh, I'm not too proud enough not to say that. But we went in there and effectively, we assessed the situation. We did some reconnaissance. Uh, and long and short, um, we we sold a ruse, uh, well, we gave an ultimatum, I suppose, to the militia in the town. We sold a ruse that we were leaving, but coming around, and then we set a, an ambush, and without firing a shot, we, uh, we captured the militia, brought back the weapons. And the wonderful thing about that, in my view, it showed force projection, it showed Interfet's ability to react, and it showed us the ability to achieve and stop violence without firing one shot. And that was important, and that was a that was a major operation that occurred. Tim, I don't know if you want to lead into the uh, Suai operation. Suai, or, yeah. Or Tiba. Tiba, yeah, okay. Um, uh, in the in speaking about uh, Com, it was very interesting. I, I had not worked for a, a a commander previously, or all the commanders that I'd worked for previously, were relatively conservative in their actions, and when I briefed the intelligence to General Cosgrove uh, concerning the, the uh, 1,500 internally displaced personnel on the wharf at Com, and the fact that they were under threat and uh, the like. I remember briefing to him then a concept of operation. And to my consternation, he turned to me, looked me straight in the eye and said, I want you to go and to go now. And I remember thinking, Gosh, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> um, 
and uh, immediately saying, thank you, sir, turned on my heels, and as I was walking out of the room, said, get the helicopters turning and burning. We need to deploy this force before, first, uh, before last light. And I think we had two hours in which to deploy James's force. Hardly the way in which a professional uh, soldier should deploy the, ba the regular bat battle rhythm that you would give to soldiers. But I had the confidence and the knowledge that the soldiers that I had under my command and the soldiers of the 5th Aviation Regiment and all those people in support, the Royal Australian Navy uh, being able to provide the, the naval support and uh, the AME assistance, the aeromedical evacuation assistance, were there to backstop us and to assist us in our task. So I'm eternally grateful for their endeavours. I want to talk now just quickly about an incident that occurred uh, in a small village called T-Bar. And the reason I want to illustrate it is to just to show the fluidity of operations and how someone as well trained as uh, we were, and we were extraordinarily well trained for the context in which we were operating, how things can turn on a, in an instant and um, you can find yourself in a very dicky position very, very quickly. Uh, we had had several walk-ins come into the heliport where we were resident at the time and they had indicated to us that they knew uh, the location of several graves, um, uh, seven or eight um, uh, graves, and they wanted to reveal those to us. Under General Cosgrove's uh, concurrence, I set up a small graves registration team, which its sole task was to go out to identify the human remains, get a a specific GPS location for those human remains, disinter the body to try and identify who the individual might be, if they were carrying any papers or anything of that, or their clothes, just in order to identify them, then to reinter, reinter the bodies respectfully. Because we knew that there would be legal ramifications and legal review subsequently. And so I had, after visiting General Cosgrove's headquarters, about an hour to spare. And I said, uh, let's go to T-Bar, five kilometres over beyond the heliport, to uh, see how this graves registration team are going. And we drove through the small uh, village of T-Bar, adjacent to uh, Dilly. And I can remember being slightly perplexed because this was about day three that we were there. As we came through the village, all the locals were holding up a big sign that they had clearly painted up, Viva Interfet. And I thought, gosh, how do these people know that we're here and what we're doing? It was, it was kind of reassuring. And I, I can remember thinking as I drove past them, I hope we meet their expectations of us. And I visited the Graves registration uh, team at the top of the hill and they were surrounded by about 70 local males and a few females. I was about to get in the vehicle to leave and uh, this Graves registration team was a scratch team. It had uh, a catering officer, a medical officer, a military uh, police officer uh, or individual and a couple of uh, crafts, a craftsman, a clerk and a number of other individuals. So they weren't a robust SAS force element uh, that you would normally uh, ascribe to an SAS contingent. Uh, there was a series of gunshots, about five or six gunshots from down in the little town of um, um, T-Bar. I looked down to the, the village to see perhaps two or three hundred, mainly women and children, running across the village into the bush and to see a number of the buildings start on fire. And uh, I looked back to a number of the SAS individuals there and the, the 70 or so Timorese males looked at me as if to say, well, what are you going to do now? <laughs> You're here, in effect. You'd better do something. I looked at it and thought, there is only one way back into Dili, and it's through that small village. And I put together a scratch team of five individuals, six individuals, sorry. Uh, we drove down to uh, the village of Tibar dismounted from our vehicle and uh, cleared along the sides of the road uh, 
before immediately a, a vehicle came around the corner and it had three individuals in it. We apprehended those individuals, one of whom ran away um, in a Bremob um, uniform. And our rules of engagement, of course, did not permit a, a, you to engage anyone who was running away. And so the individual was allowed to go away. But the other two individuals we apprehended, we detained and um, disarmed them. And they were armed with SKS um, uh, carbines. They were well armed and well equipped and they were, um, without embellishing it, they, were, they knew exactly what they were doing. Um, I indicated that I wanted to clear to the corner of the road so that I could see a route back to Dilly so that we could take the detainees back to, back to General Cosgrove's headquarters. Um, to my consternation, my uh, intelligence officer said, boss, look behind you. I looked over my shoulder and to my horror, three truckloads of uh, what I assumed to be uh, militia, and they were all uh, clad in militia gear, half camouflage, half T-shirts with ITARAC red uh, bands on, all, all carrying um, 5.56 automatic weapons. They were all well armed. So in each, the, and the three vehicles promptly uh, catching us unawares, pulled up alongside uh, the detainees on the ground and trained their weapons on us. Three of whom were on one side of the, the track in good cover. And I unfortunately was out in the open with a craftsman and a young uh, clerk soldier. My immediate thought was, I have got these young men killed. Um, it's a, um, a very, very uh, salutary experience to be in a predicament where you are in total control, extraordinarily well trained, and then in a split second think, I wonder what it's like to die. I wonder, will I be able to uh, pull off some uh, fire? Will I be able to kill anybody in the back of that vehicle? And I can remember thinking, I've got to regain the control here somehow. And I yelled to the men on the far side, switch to auto, switch to auto. Um, and uh, the reason I did that was to try and, um, uh, I guess, intimidate the men in the truck, all of whom were training their weapons on us. At that point, uh, they became very confused and slightly flustered, recognising that people were behind them. Um, and so, uh, we were able to um, sort of regain some semblance of control as we started to withdraw. And uh, I must say, uh, I held that detainee for perhaps two minutes, which is probably a record, uh, before he was very promptly released and taken by um, the truckloads of um, soldiers. And they went to the other side of the T-Bar village, disgorged from the trucks, and started to uh, walk in an assault line back towards us, burning every single village, uh, every single house in that village. Um, as I say, a very, very salutary experience for an individual who was in total control and then within split seconds, uh, as has been experienced by thousands of soldiers over the eons, uh, you are out of control, uh, subject to uh, the vagaries of chance. Well, I'll, uh, thanks for that, Tim. I'll, I'll, uh, I haven't heard some of that. It was, it was interesting. <laughs> but I, uh, it, 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 it typifies, and I think uh, with risk, you do get reward. And I think uh, I can say that about all of Vinterfet on the ground. Uh, further on, uh, after T-Bar into October, there were a number of contacts. I won't go through those. Uh, there's Suai. Um, and there was a number of contacts from, from the brigade forces, the infantry battalions down on the border. Uh, but the only thing I'd reflect there is in, you know, we talk about traditions and being on the, the War Memorial Council. Um, but I only thing I want to mention at Suai is uh, after that, where we got ambushed and we subsequently cleared the area, went into a defensive position, showed our ability to react again and win on the ground. Uh, and showed that we had teeth when we need to use it and use appropriate force. I'll never forget the scene as we're rolling up in the reaction force to see under fire 
a medic from that particular force element treating two people under fire in the best traditions of the Australian Defence Force, and that memory will stay with me well forever. Uh, and there's been many, many more courageous acts that our historian Craig will, will no doubt has been documenting. But I'll finish off just a little bit of my prepared spot, part of my speech. This will take just 30 seconds because there are some things I want to conclude in saying. Our reflections on Op Spitfire and Op Stabilise are from an on-the-ground perspective and there's many people in this room as across the ADF and all the other services to this country that have, that have contributed. In effect, did achieve peace and stability that provided a platform for the Timor Leste of today, in my view. Growing, peaceful and a place of hope, having just been there. Uh, our final reflections, uh, in effect, comes at a cost. I've got to say this, but no family is left untouched when a member of our Defence Force is killed, permanently injured or mentally uh, injured on operations. Today, it is important also to acknowledge that that cost, that those, there is a cost to those that have served and those that continue to serve this and their families and to ensure that we continue to give them the support they require. Our lasting reflection on Intervet is that is it a reminder as highlighted by the exhibition that we saw this morning, The Courage for Peace, to be grateful for the peace and freedoms we all have and remind ourselves and pass on to future generations that the cost of that peace and freedom is to stand up together and fight for what is right. Lest we forget, and as I heard many times in Timor, viva East Timor. <laughs> Tim uh, and James, I, I think our historians were taking a few notes there, uh, so <laughs> I, I suspect Craig Stockings will be going back to just do a few edits on his, uh, on his official history, but I, I think I reflect uh, the sentiment of the audience when I say to you that we are privileged uh, to have just heard you both speak, uh, reflect on not only what you did, but those men whom you led in East Timor did and give all of us, uh, particularly we civilians, just a little glimpse into the, the character, uh, the values, the qualities of leadership, and indeed the courage and humanity that is embedded in the uniform of the Australian Army, and in particular, uh, the SAS. So thank you so much to both of you. Uh, I'd also say to the team, uh, Oh, that is the image. Oh, you terrific. That is the, the previous image was wonderful, but that is uh, what uh, Sir Peter this morning described as the signature image of the campaign and the operations in East Timor. Uh, and now the uh, political affairs advisor for the embassy of Timor-Leste is Corinda Hollis. And uh, Corinda is an Australian and uh, by definition deeply committed to the country of Timor-Leste. Uh, a graduate of ANU who came in part to her deep uh, investment in the people of Timor-Leste through the United Nations Youth Forum and then subsequently an internship with TALUS uh, Australia and for about 18 months now has been working for the people of Timor-Leste. So I suspect, Corinda, when you started on your journey, you didn't imagine you would be sharing a platform with Pro former Prime Minister Howard, uh, Sir Peter Cosgrove, two SS, SAS operatives and the official historian. But uh, we're really looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting, the Ngunnawal people, and um, pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. It is my great privilege to speak to you today amongst such um, illustrious uh, company to reflect on the expectations and experiences of the people of East Timor towards the events of 1999. Um, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Honourable John Howard, um, Dr Brendan Nelson, Sir Peter Cosgrove, my other speakers, um, Interfit veterans and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 20 years on from the events of 1999, 
the experiences of the youngest Timorese generation, those born in the aftermath of that absolutely tumultuous year, are unimaginably different from their parents and grandparents. They know only peace and not of the death-defying acts of their forebears. They know the significance of Interfit, but only through stories. I was in Dili a few years ago in a school and a student asked me where I was from, as you do. I said, I'm from Australia. And they said, you must know Peter Cosgrove then. He led Interfit. <laughs> and the best part, he goes, years later, he came back and gave me a dictionary. And I thought I was just really proud that that was the association that that student had of Australia. And that was, that was the memory and, and legacy of that mission. Um, un unlike the, the other speakers, I had no direct involvement in the events of 1999. Um, but I have had the privilege to visit Timor-Leste on several occasions under a time of peace and to study and work alongside my Timorese colleagues, whose experiences amongst many others have provided me with valuable perspective. It is their experiences amongst many other stories that I have the honour um, to reflect upon today. There is an old Canossian nun who some in the audience may be familiar with her name, uh, Sister Elsa, or Avo Madre, as she's called. Um, I first met Sister Elsa in 2014 and again in 2017. To me, she encapsulates the resilience, courage, defiance and sadness that permeates through the Timorese who experienced the hardships of 1999. Sister Elsa survived the massacre at Suai, saw babies ripped from mother's chests and stood in front of militia to stop violence escalating between two young teenagers who'd lost a family member and wanted to avenge their death. Sister Elsa's still working in Maliana and still protecting the most vulnerable in Timorese society. The experience of the people of East Timor in 1999 was a dichotomy of feelings. On one hand, those events were despair and death, and on the other hand, complete elation and rebirth. The vote on the 30th of August, which secured that path to independence, was followed by absolute terror. And hundreds of thousands of people were displaced from their homes and from East Timor itself. The majority of Timorese had chosen that incredibly brave path to independence, but they suffered for it. Today, in the rest of my time, I'm going to focus um, on talking about the experiences that centre around three main periods. So leading up to the vote, the vote itself, and the subsequent arrival of, of Interfit. There was much unrest amongst the communities in Timor in the lead up to the vote, demonstrating the absolute enormity of the situation. Violent militia groups had ravaged the streets in the lead up which only created and added to a cascading effect um, amongst motions of, of fear and helplessness. Students were fearful of going to school. Then 16-year-old Rosario Cruz stopped going to school at Bazatete High School. He said, some of my classmates were carrying machetes and knives designed to intimidate and make terror, particularly targeting pro-independent students like me. In another town, Tsuai, at least 1,800 refugees were forced to shelter in the church before the vote. And for over 200, they would be killed only a few days after the vote during the militia's bloody rampage through their district. Despite that absolute terror induced by the militias running the streets during the pre-vote period designed to intimidate people away from voting, the East Timorese were defiant in the numbers that turned up to vote. The opportunity to vote had left the people of Timor-Leste with mixed feelings of defiance and fear. Ambassador Abel Guterres, uh, my boss, having returned to Timor-Leste for the first time in 24 years in 1999 to vote, was chased and shot at by militia following, um, following the vote. Before that, when he'd lined up in Dili at a school which um, he tells me was directly across from the Santa Cruz Cemetery. He asked those around him, aren't you afraid? And they were. But 
they were proud to vote on behalf of their relatives that had been killed and it was incredibly important for them to turn up on that day. The mentality Ambassador Guterres um, said that he had was, if they shoot me, so be it, because I'm home and I've cast my vote. Following the vote, the militia violence, as we've heard, has spread out from Dili and villages were ransacked and attacked. That fear of retribution following the result was ever present in people's minds. Many were consumed with desperation to find a safe place to shelter, whether that be in other people's houses, in abandoned buildings, with nuns, or as many did in the UN compound in Dili. Local UNAMED staff, Afonso de Jesus, remembers the UN compound full of people on the 4th of September, crying, asking, when is the international force coming? It was a time of great uncertainty for local um, Timorese UN staff, especially for those who would be evacuated and it did not know what had happened to their colleagues or to their own families. Young people were witness to horrific crimes and many would escape violence in one town only to encounter it in another. The experiences of many Timorese in 1999 throughout this period was that of sexual violence, torture, destruction of property, extrajudicial killing and forcible displacement. But after that announcement of the referendum result on the 4th of September, people could not help to be jubilant, but incredibly hesitant and fearful for what was sure to come. In Dili, then 16-year-old Rosario Cruz remembers that there was terror everywhere. Militias had started to kill innocent people and burned houses and some public buildings. Thousands of people had fled to Atambua and Kupang, forced by the militias and the Indonesian military forces, and the majority of Timorese people had fled to the nearest safe mountains. The country was ungoverned after UNAMET left. People were desperately waiting for international forces to intervene. Finally, on the 20th of September, he says, we could see Black Hawk helicopters flying over in Dili. That was the happiest moment for us, as I could see some people greeting each other with tears of happiness when they had heard that Interfit had arrived in Dili. For so many, it was absolute relief. Former President Jose Ramos Horta talks of what it meant to see the first Australian Hercules and transport planes and the ships upon the horizon. When you were on the edge, when you were on the abyss, and then suddenly hope appears on the horizon. Ramos Horta's words encapsula encapsulate that salient feeling that Interfit brought. The mission had allowed the Timorese to embark on the path that they had chosen to independence and supported them through establishing security, providing help with essential infrastructure, medical supplies, and often kind, smiling faces just with a wave. Amalida de Jesus Amaral, reflecting upon her experience in 1999, remembers, the helicopters flew above us. We could see them passing by. Sometimes we climbed up trees and raised Timor Leste's flag so the soldiers could see the flag. Then we'd heard that the Interfit helicopter had landed on the airstrip. We started packing our stuff to carry back to our village. I don't know what would have happened if Interfit hadn't come here. I probably wouldn't be able to talk to you right now. It was the presence of Interfit that encouraged us as a small nation. For some, though, they'd felt that an international force had come too late to Timor-Leste. They'd already lost so much, lost hope, and felt abandoned by the international community. When word spread that Interfit had arrived and had started to restore peace and security, it meant that people could start to slowly return from the mountains or their place of hiding, many hesitant, slowly edging down from their refuge. 
For many, it meant that they had to start completely again from scratch when they arrived back home. But even for those who did not have much interaction with Interfit, they still remember the kind soldiers from 20 years ago. Antonio de Ragas recalls that Interfit treated people equally. For the ones who supported independence and the ones who didn't, there was no difference. There was anticipation, relief and immense gratitude felt with the arrival of Interfit, that the Timorese had paid a heavy price for their independence, but they knew that it was a vital intervention. What the people of Timor-Leste experienced in the aftermath of the popular consultation was an absolute and all-encompassing humanitarian crisis. The conflict and the violence that had been part of the last 24 years leading up to this only intensified. But it was Interfet who helped the Timorese under their protection ensure that the long-suffering yet defiant Timorese were able to take their first steps into nationhood. So that in their country, for most of whom would be born in the years following, and the majority of whom are under the age of 25, would not experience such events again and would know only peace and security in their independence. Interfit helped establish lasting peace in Timor-Leste and rejuvenated that incredible friendship that was established by the Australian commandos in World War II. Timor-Leste is a country reborn from the ashes. The role that Interfit played alongside the people of Timor-Leste and their determination for peace and independence is a story that should continue to be celebrated for its success for future generations to remember. This has created not only a peaceful climate in Timor-Leste, but also one full of promise. The new generation has a unique perspective of their freedom and independence because of the sacrifice and contribution of Timorese before them and of the Interfit forces. They feel the suffering of those before them, all of them before them. And this has created a burning desire, a desire to never take their situation for granted, their independence for granted, and a desire to always strive towards the betterment of themselves their families and their country, Timor-Leste. And as James has said before, viva Timor-Leste. Thank you. Mr. Soares, uh, I think you can tell Corinda's boss, Ambassador Gutierrez, that today she has done your country proud. Uh, she has brought to life the fears, the courage and the hope of the East Timorese people. And when Sir Peter Cosgrove is next in Dili, they will ask him, have you met Corinda Hollis? <laughs> so, well done, Corinda. Well done. That wasn't easy. Well done. Uh, now, in life, you make some good decisions. Uh, in 2014, I said to then Prime Minister Abbott, I said, do you realise, Tony, that if the Australian government today made a decision to fund the official histories of Afghanistan, Iraq and East Timor, it will be at least 10 years before these men and women whose history is being told will read a single page of it. To his credit, for which we're immensely grateful, the Abbott government then committed $12.7 million over seven years for us to commission and appoint an official historian, build a team of historians and research and write that history. From a very competitive field, we chose Professor Craig Stockings, uh, an RMC graduate of uh, Duntroon again, who actually served in East Timor with 3RAR during these operations was Professor of History at UNSW Canberra when we chose him for this uh, position. Uh, he has amongst his many publications, by the way, uh, former Prime Minister Howard, written the history of the Australian Defence Cadets, which I know is very close to your heart and mine. And uh, it has been a bit of a battle uh, for Professor Stockings, dealing with the various agencies who understanding of 
understandably are very protective about the information and so on and so forth, but uh, we are right behind you, Craig, and uh, welcome. And for our concluding address, Craig Stockings. Well, thank you, Brandon, for that very kind introduction. Distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take the time I have with you to reflect upon what are, in my opinion, some of the enduring legacies of this nation's response to the crisis in East Timor back in 1999, and perhaps their continuing relevance for the Australia of today. Well, the critical political and strategic circumstances of the crisis and the Australian Defence Force's contribution to it in the form of Interfet has been well described by previous speakers today. This was the single biggest deployment of the ADF since the Second World War, larger than Vietnam at its peak in 1967. It was also the first time this country had led such a large multinational force and has been noted all from a standing start. In short, in my view, Indefet was perhaps the most com complex strategic challenge this nation had faced at least since the 1940s. Moreover, again, as been noted, the operation proved to be one of the most successful United Nations sanctioned peacemaking operations ever seen. And such a triumph had repercussions, not only in East Timor, obviously, but in Canberra as well. Interfet defined the career of its commander, the then Major General Peter Cosgrove, for example, and helped frame John Howard's prime ministership, in my view. All that followed in the new millennium were in many ways aftershocks compared to how the Prime Minister emerged as a national security leader in 1999. It is to some of these issues and a number of others upon which I'll focus today and all in the context of my current role as official historian of a multi-volume series dealing with Australian involvement in Iraq from 2003 to 11, Afghanistan from 2001 to 14 and East Timor from 1999 to 2012. <clears throat> The importance of this project, I think, speaks to itself. No less than 60,000 ADF and public servant per service personnel have served or deployed or supported these deployments over 15 years of operations. Sadly, some 44 Australians have died on active service in these theatres and hundreds, hundreds more have been wounded. The social and military effect of these conflicts globally and within Australia has been profound. This latest official history series is the sixth produced by this country and continues a long uh, a tradition established by Charles Bean in his work as general editor and principal author of the 15 volume official history of Australia in the war of 1914-18. There is no question that each of the five histories that have followed have faced their own challenges and enjoyed their own advantages. Yet the effort to chronicle a wide and diverse range of ADF operations, both near and far for the period 1999 to 2014, marks an entirely new paradigm. This is especially so in terms of the sensitivities and security considerations associated with an unprecedented impact of intelligence and the intelligence agencies on tactical military operations. It's also true, of course, for the mechanics of research and the broader environment, shall I say, under which my team has laboured. It's less so, of course, in terms of, tradi of the tradition and philosophy of past official histories, which we hope to extend or perhaps enhance. My commission, ladies and gentlemen, provides for controlled access to relevant government files and records subject only to national security considerations. So these volumes will themselves be unclassified and are written with that outcome in mind. They are based upon a thorough study of the classified record made available by the government for the operations covered. Material therefore excluded from my team in whole or part is only that judged by the relevant government agencies as potentially damaging to Australian national security. I do not expect such omissions, and there haven't been many, will alter the conclusions we will make in any of the volumes in any significant manner. I would further note that the era when official histories could be written almost exclusively from defence records has long passed. Like the operations they describe and analyse, all of these volumes require input from the whole of government and whole of government sources. 
To this end, this study is not just based on military records, but on documents from a whole range of Commonwealth agencies. In some instances, this record itself is not as complete as might be hoped, given the speed of events and the challenges posed by archiving by the growth of electronic media. In any case, such a record that exists has been supplemented by an extensive interviewing program by my team, vital for getting behind what sometimes appears as an artificial consensus in the documentary record. But at their heart, at their heart, these volumes are written for the tens of thousands of Australians who deploy to these theatres under the 15 years covered, and for the tens of thousands more who supported them on a professional level back home or emotionally with love and best wishes for a safe return. They're written to shed light for the wider Australian community who perhaps only had a brief or passing connection with the events at hand. They are further, further written, at least I hope, for the interest and education of generations not yet born when East Timor achieved its independence. To this end, this series is a start, then a first brick in a foundation of scholarship that must grow, particularly as the documents upon which our work is based begin to be released into the public domain from this year. In terms of the volume concerned specifically with the crisis of 1999 and enduring impact of events at that time, let me assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that for all that happened since, politicians, government officials and military officers at the very highest levels were concerned more about what might happen as Interfet deployed to Dili than over any other issue, in most cases at any other time in their careers beforehand or afterwards. This was our backyard and it involved our most important northern neighbour. It was our show. If it all went badly and this was perceived at the time as a real risk, the consequences were potentially disastrous. There is no question then as September approached, the high-level machinery of Australian national security was feeling the strain. Faced with the looming reality of a direct military intervention in Timor, the antithesis of long-standing political and diplomatic objectives, as, as has been noted, the atmosphere in the National Security Committee of Cabinet, for example, moved from tension to stress. Tensions also permeated key relationships between departments in Canberra. That between the foreign and defence ministers, to name one example, was perhaps less cordial as it might have been. As the likelihood of military operations took centre stage, so did the Department of Defence, and the transition to defence-led policy making was not without its frictions for those, for those agencies more accustomed to setting the agenda, such as foreign affairs, for example, or Prime Minister and Cabinet. In short order, NSC laid down four conditions which needed to be met before Interfet might be executed. Indonesian consent, UN authorisation, a clear endorsement of a significant number of ASEAN member states, and US support. In terms of the last point, this equated to a guarantee for real military assistance should the deployment face serious challenge. As the former Prime Minister noted, however, efforts in this regard did get off to a rather unexpectedly shaky start when the Prime Minister rang President Clinton on the 6th of September, a fortnight before the deployment, to specifically discuss what assistance the Americans might be able to provide, and to emphasise his personal preference for American boots on the ground. The Prime Minister was surprised at Clinton's reply, which emphasised the overstretched nature of the American military at the time and hostility within Congress to these types of interventions, given the circumstances. Foreign Minister Alexander Downer was similarly stunned and he allowed his disappointment to show on an interview on CNN, which led to a rather frank exchange of views with the American Secretary of State, <laughs> Madeleine Albright, with Mr Downer again emphasising his disappointment at the negative sounds emanating from Washington regarding US involvement and reiterating not just the military, but the symbolic value of active US support. Now, the point here is policymakers in Washington and at the Pentagon took the point. Australia had been there for the US in the past and was expected to be there in the future. It was now time, perhaps, for some quid pro quo. And it was not long before Wellington, sorry, Washington did indeed confirm that all Australian requests were to be met including a commitment to backstop the ADF 
if things got out of hand, but with the continuing caveat that no US combat soldiers would deploy. NSC was briefed accordingly and confirmed once again, such was the atmosphere of stress, that he wanted a watertight guarantee that if the Indonesian armed forces resist the operation, this would result in direct US intervention and for this message to be relayed to Jakarta in advance. Again, the green light was given. Never let it be said the Americans weren't there. Independently, and with no reference to the Pentagon, US Pacific Command also drew up its own plans for an evacuation of the UN force if the need ever arose. Once more, however, stressing the perceived danger at the time, on the 8th of September, now 12 days from deployment, public statements from Indonesia seemed to indicate Jakarta would not accept a UN-sponsored force, thus removing one of NSC's four key considerations. Repeating a warning first given to international diplomats to the UN seven days earlier, the Indonesian Foreign Minister warned that any nations who were considering to sending peacekeepers to the province might find themselves having to shoot their way in. This was followed by reports of Indonesia's Air Force chief warning his forces were, quote, ready to face intruders from Australia. Planners and policymakers across government and across the ADF correctly assumed such sabre rattling could not hold back the tide of international pressure, but serious conflict always remained a terrifying possibility. Nor were fears solely based on reactions by the Indonesian military. The self-styled militias, which had been discussed in the province, were a threat in their own right. A draft press statement prepared for the Chief of Defence Force on the 10th September, we're 10 days out now, was clear. My information based on eyewitness accounts from my own people and other information sources, it read, quote, is that the militias armed with modern small arms have been conducting an orchestrated campaign of terror. With it was feared, the active support from uniformed elements within the province. Meanwhile, militia leaders and anti-independence figures warned uh, <coughs> anti-independence figures in the troubled province made predictions of their own. <coughs> Pardon me. Governor Soares, for example, warned, quote, if Australia sends a peacekeeping force, we will be ready for them. There are thousands of us still. We will face them. We will fight you when you arrive. Back in Jakarta, one key advisor to President Habibi was reported in the Indonesian press stating that Australian servicemen and women would be singled out for attack. She reported this warning on the Australian date, SBS Dateline program of the evening of the 15th of September, five days out. Meanwhile, militia leaders expressed their own macabre desire to exact a toll in blood on any foreign troops that might dare to set foot in East Timor. Thus, for all the assumptions Regarding outward Indonesian cooperation or toleration of the Interfet landings, Australian planners could never discount a doomsday scenario of a significant conflagration with Indonesian military elements. Given the, quote, considerable evidence of cooperation between uniformed elements and the militia, noted Defence Minister Moore, one has to be prepared for any eventuality. In an appreciation submitted to NSC 72 hours before the launch of Interfet, the CDF assessed that while conventional Indonesian forces would likely cooperate and then be withdrawn, militia groups, possibly backed by covert elements, would likely try to test Interfet's resolve. He emphasised that the government could not dismiss the, dismiss the possibility of a spiralling set of circumstances that might lead to a wider conflict. Even though the, though the Indonesians had by this point agreed to the intervention, one argument ran there was no guarantee its own political leadership could fully control the instruments at the military's disposal. There was also little doubt of what, in what would invariably be a charged environment in Dili upon arrival, it might only take a small start to spark to accidentally ignite a serious um, incident. <clears throat> it's in this context then, on the very eve of Interfed, on the 19th of September, as he described the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, the leader of the opposition, Kim Beasley, the leader of the Democrats, Meg Lees, the Minister of Defence and the CDF all gathered in Townsville to farewell Three Brigade. The Prime Minister was emotional, well aware of the uncertainty that lay ahead. While the deployment of the SAS to Kuwait in 1998 had likely shaped government thinking about the use of military force and perhaps it increased its confidence to do so in its second term, Interfet was an order of magnitude beyond this decision. 
Howard himself later described the choice for the deployment as far and away the most significant his government had yet made. After the formalities, politicians and senior ADF officers dined in the soldiers' mess, once more bringing home the personal aspects of the force about to deploy. As they walked, the Prime Minister and his wife saw NCOs talking quietly with groups of their soldiers. He stopped to talk to them, all the while conscious some might not be coming home. It was a heavy, or it must have been a heavy, personal burden. There was reason to worry, even beyond the serious loss of life that could have accompanied even a short-term conflagration with the Indonesian military, the effect of such an event in the region would have been disastrous on many levels, most obviously diplomatically and economically, but others too. But here's the point. For all the sleepless nights, Interfent went well. Much was achieved at very little human cost. As the deployment unfolded, smiles began to replace those worried scowls. Much political and other capital was garnered after the fact. Decision makers at a high level emerged from the crisis in Timor with a greater knowledge and perhaps a greater confidence in the application of military force than had previously been the case. To what degree such factors subsequently shape decisions to deploy or employ the ADF at different times and in different places is perhaps impossible to measure, yet it's equally hard not to speculate. Just as it was for so many within the ADF, East Timor was the start, not the end of experience with deployment for many senior decision makers right up to the Prime Minister's office. Had operations in Timor not concluded with such an outstanding success, for me it's not too much to wonder how much more different recent Australian military history might have been. Political elites aside, I'd further argue that the crisis left an indelible mark on the wider Australian community. Remarkably, as events in the troubled province came to a head in September, the public demanded military intervention, and one on a scale not seen since Vietnam, demanded. It did so in an age of instant communications and a saturation of traditional and internet reporting with images of the atrocities being perpetrated in Timor as they happened, thus in the full knowledge of the dangers involved. This was a remarkable turnaround in public acceptance of the need for military deployment forces and their deployment of Australian troops abroad, a signal perhaps of shifting attitudes in a post-Vietnam populace. Domestic pr pressure associated with how and when the government should react to, this, to the uh, crisis ramped up exponentially and in direct proportion to the dramatic upturn in violence in the first week of December. September, rather. The terrible crimes of the province were comprehensively reported by, I've got to say, brave Australian media, media and such images created public outcry. Often this took the, the form, as, as has been noted, to deploy the ADF immediately, from talkback radio to opposition taunting. All major Australian newspapers argued for an immediate ADF involvement. The Prime Minister's staff were flooded by letters from state politicians and religious leaders, interest groups, unions and private citizens. The situation was same in, the same in the Defence Minister's office, inundated by public calls for action across the full spectrum of the Australian community, from school children to retirees. In response to a deluge of questions in Parliament, Alexander Downer could only exasperately repeat the Australian Government was doing all it could and that any, peace, any deployment of peace courses was peacekeepers was dependent on Indonesian agreement. Any attempt to do so in advance, as Mr Howard has noted, would have been tant tantamount to declaring war. Though entirely true, these were increasingly unsatisfactory answers for a public and parliament shocked by what it was seeing. As each day ticked, images of the raising of Dili, the suffering of the, team, of the Timorese, continued to assail Australians at their nightly news programs and became the subject of any number of heated conversations in cafes, bars and dinner tables. A Sydney Morning Herald editorial of the 8th of September represented what was rapidly becoming a firm public consensus. The immediate and urgent question of what must be done to stop further crimes, it noted, and the short answer is whatever it takes. Pub <coughs> public rallies be had begun in Sydney as early as the 6th of September when East Timorese activists and several hundred trade unionists protested outside the Sydney office 
of Garuda Airlines, calling for the deployment of a multinational force. Two days later, a much larger rally was held in the city with around 4,000 workers walking off their jobs to join in. Garbage workers in Sydney, with the support of the Randwick Council, refused to pick up rubbish from the Indonesian consulate. Similarly, printing workers refused to print Indonesian products and the Maritime Union of Australia prevented the loading of all Indonesia-bound ships. Public agitation, though, continued to rise. A rally of the Saturday the 11th of September in Hyde Park began with 15,000 attendees and ended with double that number. It was a similar situation in Melbourne where 30,000 rallied in the city on the short notice on the 10th of September and 40,000 more gathered on Sunday the 19th. The Australian public grew ever more strident in its demands for actions, including the use of the ADF. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment, because that would be wrong, to suggest such civic activism forced the government's hand on this issue. It didn't. The movement towards the deployment was in well in advance before these rallies got into full swing. But in my view, at least, there were crucial background music for Australian politicians who did not have to look hard to predict the consequences of not taking rapid or decisive action. Conversely, and again, I think this is important, as Interfet began and began to be successful, the public memory almost immediately began to drift from strategic and policy calculations or policy enigmas or operational issues to drift even from the horrific crimes perpetrated against these Timorese. Instead, it was the faces of the locals, the smiling children, families rebuilding their, their lives amidst the rubble that had been left to them that were in the enduring images of Interfet. The feeling of helping a desperate and grateful people was what Interfet veterans carried home with them. This was the achievement beyond all else that's said or written about Australian involvement in Operation East Timor in this period, it's this legacy that must endure. Yet some felt uneasy. The Chief of Army in 1999, Lieutenant General Frank Hickling, told a parliamentary committee in June 2000, the final lesson we need to absorb, not only as an army but as a society, is that Interfet was not war. Yet East Timor felt like victory. From its initial deployment to its welcome home parade, to what extent then did this experience shape community attitudes to the acceptance of the use of Australian military power abroad in the early years of the new millennium? To what degree were lingering fears and suspicions of the deployment of Australian troops overseas, fears, I've got to say, that were older than Federation itself, allayed by Interfet's accomplishments? To follow this line of thinking, how much did such feelings feed into subsequent politico-diplomatic and military calculations? If the ADF in 1999 had received a bloody nose, would subsequent deployments still have occurred at least in the scale or duration that unfolded thereafter? Well, let me change gears now for a moment, discuss another important aspect of the deployment and its long-term impact. It is important to understand that ADF operations in Timor, Timor were never the product of a considered long-term strategic planning and policy process, but rather in many ways a reversal of that process. There was, to be blunt, a chasm between what policymakers wanted to achieve in Timor in 1998 and what was actually achieved in Timor by February 2000. Australian bureaucrats never sought East, Timor, East Timorese independence until that choice was made for them by an Indonesian president and by the East Timorese themselves. On the contrary, the preferred outcome, as it had been for more than two decades, was a process that would both engage the locals in their own political future and in the process legitimise, in a, to use a turn of phrase, an ongoing Indonesian incorporation of the province. Doing so would remove what was called at the time the burr in the saddle of the bilateral relationship and diminish the international stigma generated by Indonesia's occupation of the territory, a stigma so carefully, stubbornly and successfully husbanded by the East Timor lobby group around the globe for 25 years. Thus, in some ways, the tears of joy that we heard about shedding Dili as Interfet deployed represented, on one level at least, a reversal of long-term Australian policy. There has been, noted one former and very senior official from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, quote, a lot of sort of post-event rewriting of history, 
about Australia being the liberator in East Timor. Whilst this might be true, in 1998, he continued, being the liberator was the last thing on our minds. But none of this is to cast moral or ethical judgment on bureaucratic policy or actions. Whether you agree with those long-term policy consensus or not, its strategic logic stands and has always stood. Indeed, for a real politic, cold calculation of purely Australian national interests and nothing more, it's watertight. The issue, perhaps, was that the wider Australian public did not uniformly share such assumptions or such perspectives. Certainly 40,000 men and women marching in Melbourne didn't. The wider point, then, is that such a disconnect between public policy and public expectations has legacies all of its own. After Interfed has run its course, the politics and policies of what led to its creation, from my research and experience, began to rankle many veterans. At one level, most understood and understand the practical need to re-establish as close and cooperative relationship with Jakarta as possible. Yet for many, an unsettled type of feeling remains. Thousands of Australian servicemen and servicewomen saw with their own eyes what had unfolded in East Timor and who'd been responsible. Hundreds of their more senior officers and non-commissioned officers with access to intelligence product and collected observations knew this in some depth. Dozens more high-ranking officers in East Timor and back in Australia, along with their civilian counterparts across multiple agencies, knew in considerable detail. Nearly 20 years later, those involved are unanimous in their assessment of the violence in East Timor and its perpetrators. At the time, ADF members did not need to reconcile such issues. They had to get on with the job. More broadly, though, years later, with the passage of time and time for reflections, many veterans bear a legacy of considerable discomfort about answers to questions no one in 1999 wanted to ask. Finally, then, let me now reflect on Timor's enduring influence on the ADF as an organisation. The crisis was without question a crucible that both tested and reforged not only defence but this wider Australian national security apparatus. NSC, ministers, intelligence agencies and a range of departments, not just defence, gained much valuable experience as a result. New systems and structures were put in place, new pecking orders emerged. The relationship between defence and foreign affairs, for example, found a fresh equilibrium. Critics called it a militarisation of foreign policy. Advoc advocates a confirmation that the military could be used as an instrument of policy rather than something entirely separate from it or entirely subordinate to it. So too the agencies of the intelligence community found old distinctions between operational and strategic intelligence were fast disappearing. Intelligence capabilities previously regarded as the realm of civilian specialists were used to provide direct operational support to the ADF, which has required significant redefinitions of roles and of functions. This operationalisation of tra traditionally strategic agencies began during East Timor, but continued apace in this vein moving forward. Meanwhile, while the, all the plaudits are of course well deserved, and believe in the histories, we do discuss all the plaudits. The wider events of 1999 rocked the Department of Defence and the ADF to their core. Thanks to the international context of this deployment, US posturing and decisions made by the Indonesian government and by the Indonesian military prior to the 20th of September, Interfet did not come close to failing, but it was not challenged. The ADF did not stumble in East Timor, but it was not seriously pushed. In the process of simply mounting the operation though, even in a largely uncontested environment close to home, exposed the organisation and tested it like no peacetime exercise ever could. I don't have time for details, but let me assure you, in the process, the costs of the long peace were exposed. ADF was severely stretched. A yawning gap between advertised and actual capability was revealed. Further appropriate, without venturing into any certainty, to reflect briefly on the cultural impact of 99 on defence. With the exception of a number of high readiness units, one of which is represented here today, an essentially peacetime or peace-oriented ADF was shaken from its stupor. Old assumptions were challenged. 
Interfet was, for instance, the first time women were operationally deployed in large numbers on active service. At its height, this figure was in excess of 400 out of 5,000, a high percentage, but one still lower than the overall proportion of women in the ADF at that time. So too, the Australian Special Forces community emerged with a greatly enhanced reputation and with the confidence of the upper echelons of ADF command. As Chief of Army and then CDF, Peter Cosgrove oversaw a significant enhancement of the community, which culminated in the raising of Special Operations Command in 2003, a process itself that has changed the nature, structure and culture of the Army. Overall then, Timor ought to be seen as a start point for complex processes that unfolded for the ADF in the decade that followed. What does all this mean though for legacies connected to the official history series? In terms of philosophy, I suspect I differ very little from my predecessors. Official histories are a record of government actions and decisions based on government sources, but they are not government stories or means by which certain narratives might be perpetuated at the expense of others. They are the product of historical investigations by independent researchers. The government pays the bill, but it doesn't decide what's written. Such histories are also our foundation for future historians and an accessible way for the public and the veteran community to gain insight into the operations and theatres under examination. I think this is particularly important today given the perceptions of a disconnect between these wars and the wider Australian community. Meanwhile, our outlook has been straightforward. We do not self-censor. We include the bad with the good. Achievements in spite of institutional shortcomings tend to enhance the legacy of those involved, not the reverse. We write as the evidence trail leads. These volumes therefore aim above all else to be truthful. It's with the courage of candour and historical honesty that we honour the lived experience of those involved. Of course, the enduring impact of these efforts, beginning with the first East Timor volume, will of course be up to you and future historians to judge. Thank you. Well, Craig, thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, magnificent uh, work that you've been doing on these three volumes. Uh, Craig uh, is the principal author of the East Timor volume, which has been submitted to the relevant agencies for their consideration, and we've got uh, one or two ongoing battles in that regard. Uh, needless to say, uh, you've just had a, a bit of an insight into the scholarly, forensic, uh, but also humanising approach to the official history that Craig has been taking, and I can assure you that he has and enjoys the full and complete support of the War Memorial Council and the leadership of the memorial in making sure that uh, his independence is uh, maintained. So thank you very much. And uh, so finally, I'd just say to you, uh, those of you who obviously by definition here have a great interest in the uh, operations in East Timor of Interfet uh, in particular, uh, that the major investment being made by the government uh, generationally in expanding and creating more spaces here at the Australian War Memorial is dedicated entirely uh, to the Invictus generation of servicemen and women. Uh, 100,000 Australian veterans have been created by our country in the last 20 years at a cost of $400 billion equipping them, $22 billion in deploying them, and we are now about to start digging very shortly to create the spaces. So as I said to our Prime Minister in arguing this case, that. East Timor is perhaps the most significant thing our country has done over the last 20 years, militarily, with our Australian Federal Police, with our other government agencies, and yet the space that is currently dedicated to tell that story is embarrassingly underdone. And uh, so that, uh, a decade from now, in fact sooner, uh, the story will be told comprehensively and there will also be a permanent exhibition to explain what this country does to try and stop war and conflict in the first place and to make peace. So thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, it's, it's been an extraordinarily impressive symposium. Uh, we're all greatly enriched uh, by the time that you've put into coming here to speak to us and we thank you very much. And uh, again, Corinda, well done. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.